All the money we earn, they're little employees that we have hired. And dollars, they're the best employees you got. They work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They don't take holidays and there is no union. You've been a man who's been behind the scenes for a very long time. So you're behind the scenes, you're building up these big people, you're supporting all these big people. At a certain point you decide, I'm gonna step out and become my own brand, become like, I find it curious when people who spend a lot of time building others up decide that they're gonna build themselves up. I imagine that that there that there's some kind of shift that has to happen, that there's some kind yeah. of change. Cause you know, I I I spent all so much time behind the camera. Stepping to in front of the camera was a very uncomfortable thing for me. Yeah, I think so. For me, I had I had my own existence before that. You know, I was I'm a CPA by education. Yeah, and so I was I was sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, yeah, my my son thinks it stands for cheapest person around. So uh, <laughs> you're the you're yeah. the guy who's like, hmm, do the tips include do the tips include tax or no tax? Yeah, exactly. Guy, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and they just look at uh, for me, you know, I built this basically a, a national practice, uh, a reputation. I built this expert business before I knew it was an expert business in, in, in that, in that kind of genre, in that kind of industry. And, but I, I didn't, I wasn't satisfied. I wasn't, I wasn't happy. I was enjoying the speaking. I was enjoying doing some of that stuff, but the, the, the detail work that I needed to do as a valuation guy, as a litigation just wasn't bringing the joy anymore. And, and I started to focus more on the speaking. And through that process, I got introduced to a lot of dear, dear friends that, that are dear friends today. Uh, and, and it was in that vein where they said, you know so much about business. You've got to go put this stuff out there. And, and, I, and we, can, we can talk about it because this, the resistance and the reluctance doesn't go away. I mean, it <laughs> doesn't necessarily go away. And um, I... I have been the fortunate blessing of, of being uh, the one of one of Brendan Richard's best friends. Mm -hmm. And I help run his events. I am backstage with him at every event. I'm calling the show. I'm speaking on his stage. I'm doing the different things. Um, and he did something to me. And this, this is what, one of the things I think that we all need is he sat back. I, I was going to do an event. I wasn't going to do an event. And, you know, and he says, Hey, here's what I want you to do. We're sitting backstage, we're waiting, we're at a break. And he looks at me and he says, all I want you to do is just put a date on the calendar. You don't have to do the event. Just put a date on the calendar. And when you put a date on the calendar, you will notice that things shift for you because there happens to be a date on the calendar. Mm -hmm. And I go, okay, what harm could it do to just put a date on the calendar? So, um, so I put a date on the calendar and the next day we're backstage again. He says, you got a date on the calendar. I said, yeah, we picked this weekend, June 3rd, 4th and 5th. And I, so I still remember the date because I'm scarred. Okay. I realized I got duped and he said, Oh really? He says that's six weeks after experts Academy. And I said, yeah, he says, cool. He says, bring a jacket to experts Academy. You're getting on stage and we're selling the event. And I go, Oh man, uh -huh. he just, he just backed me into it. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, but that was, that was a long time ago. It was, I mean, we're talking probably eight, 10 years ago yeah. uh, when this happened, but that's where I started to, because here's what, it, what I think is that we have those people that, that get to know us, they see us from the outside. They see the possibility that we don't see. Yeah. We're stuck in our own little bubble and we can't see what's on the outside of the bubble. And, and he saw whatever he saw, the greatness in me. And, and Brendan, Brendan has been a catalyst and, and my mentors and friends have been catalysts and, and, and folks that have pushed me everything from writing, writing my number one bestselling book uh, was another thing that, that came out of people around me saying, you need to do that. And like I said, even as recently, my newest, my newest program is, is called the Affluence Blueprint. And, uh, you know, it's all about how do we create a financially liberated life and live a life of affluence, not opulence, but affluence. And, yeah. and, uh, and what happened was 
another dear friend, you know, James Wedmore kept, kept saying, Hey man, the things you're doing with the finances and the money and all of that stuff, the things that you taught your son to do, the things that you've done for yourself and all of these one-on-one -on -one clients that you've worked with, you got to teach it to the masses because they're struggling, they're suffering financially and they don't get it because entrepreneurs cannot follow, because I say entrepreneurs cannot follow the traditional path. And, uh, and we were at breakfast one day and I got, and he says, why are you resistant to this? And I said, he says, people are clamoring for it every this time is, you speak about this it. This is so and, funny. This is so and, funny because Evan Carmichael, I've known yes. Evan Carmichael for 15 years. Yeah. We're very, very good friends. And since like, since like 2012, he's been pushing me. He's been pushing me. He's been pushing me. He's been pushing me. And so I, when I, when I'm like, yeah, I, I can, I can see, I can see the story and I can see it when those in your circle see something in you that you don't see. And then they back you into a corner and then they force it to happen. And then you still don't believe it. And then, and then, and, it's, and then you, you're like, okay, well, you know, I've had Evan, I've had Evan get so angry with me that he's like threatened not to talk to me anymore. Like, like, oh, like, like and, and he's literally said like, like, like come back to me when you're ready to be the mark that you need to be kind of thing. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Like, so if, if, so he sees something I don't see. So I've learned now with people I trust. Yes. Just, if they see it, I just do it. Even if I don't connect the dots, even if I don't see it, if I don't understand it, you see something. You just trust I, in I it. I just trust in, I step out in faith. Yeah. And, and that's what I love about, about your it, story. It's so crazy. I mean, my book, the manuscript was written. I'd sat on it for five years. Oh. And again, I was backstage with Brendan. He goes, he, I said, here's what I'm thinking of doing. He says, let me tell you what you're thinking of doing. I go, uh oh, is this an Evan Carmichael moment, you know? Yeah. And he says, you're not getting on my stage. You're not doing anything else. I'm not supporting you for anything else until you put that daggone book out. I've had that conversation. <laughs> yeah. So like, and I'm going, oh God, no one needs another book on entrepreneurship. You know, in two weeks, we, we, we sold 16,000 books. We hit number, and it's like, these are lives that wouldn't have changed and they saw it. And so, yeah, I'm starting to still, still slow on the, on the uptake, but, I, but I'm starting to trust more because they see what we don't see. Okay, so what is it within yourself that is resistant to the change or the skepticism or the lack of trust um, because, and it, it might be what drew you to being a CPA or a business person to begin with was, is that like analytical, skeptical mind maybe, but, yeah. um, but I, I see the people that you hang out with some of the people that I know, super optimistic, super bold, super action takers. So what is it that you've had to reprogram in your mind to start to move to this? Or what is it that keeps you from just seeing what they see? Um, I think that there's two things, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have done enough things right to be uh, very successful. I've, I've also been fortunate. Well, my audience has been fortunate enough that I've done enough things wrong to be educational. <laughs> I like but, that. But I, but I got to a point, and, and I think this is a dangerous point, where I was comfortable. Mm. And rocking the boat and taking the risks that I may have taken in the past. Because when I started to build the CPA side, my partners didn't understand it because CPAs don't get back out from in front of the, behind the desk and you want to go out and speak to people. We don't speak to people. We do, we do ticking and tying and stuff. And I, and I said, no, no, we speak to people. And, uh, and they didn't. And so I think part of it was I was in a comfort zone and I built those comfort walls so high that trying to push beyond it, to be honest, I, I think it scared me. What happens that, that I, I've done well so far. Now, all of a sudden, if I don't do so well, what's going to happen? How's this going to be perceived? And all of a sudden, what's it going to look like from the outside? And, and, and I think that was probably one of the biggest things that kept me safe, at least in my mind. But it didn't keep me serving and it didn't keep me fulfilled is, is what happened. And so when you look back at, at some of these critical moments, breaking through, like, I, I want to be bold. You know, people want to be bold. We all have dreams. We all have goals. We all have high hopes. Like think how terrifying would it be to live your life only ever flirting with potential? Like, Oh gosh. Yeah. That, that would be terrible. But I, on the fringes of what might've been. Yeah. But, but of course the safety and, and the, the not wanting to hurt reputation or income or money or rock the boat or upset your family or upturn on your life. Um, 
I want to, we want to know that taking the steps always leads to the most, more beautiful outcome, even if it's painful. Can you tell us that that's in fact true? Yeah, I actually, I can. Um, and, and, and through some, some, some really difficult times. I mean, I look at my life today and um, the heartaches, the problems, the, the, the cancer, all of that brought me to who I am today. And, and, I, and I truly believe that if I took any of it away, I wouldn't be the person I am. Um, I raised my son as a single full-time dad. He was one of my greatest teachers uh, in my life. He's now 31 years old. He's, you know, one of my, uh, the, the biggest gifts, uh, you know, that was a, uh, needless to say, a tumultuous relationship with his mother for a while there, you know, because of custody and all those things. And, and in the end, I wouldn't take any of it back in, in the moment. It was horrendous. It was painful. It was stressful. It was all of that. I lost one third of my net worth in a Ponzi scheme. And, and literally, I mean, we're talking seven figures, me and two other buddies lost over four and a half million dollars at the time. It was hor horrible, but I really believe that the gifts of our life come disguised as disasters in our life at, at some point. And, and we have the choice to find the gifts, but we have the choice to, to wallow in the resentment and the erosion of, of our being. And, and, and in that process of the Ponzi scheme, things happened, things shifted. I, I, I do things differently from an, from an investment standpoint. It gave me the rules that I abide by today and that, that helped me build and rebuild and do those things. And then when the cancer came about, um, you know, it's, I'm just finishing a two-year journey with, with cancer. I'm not... Not that anyone's supposed to have cancer, but I'm not a smoker, not a drinker. I mean, uh, no one in my family's ever had cancer. It's like out of the blue, uh, this thing happened. And I lived a pretty healthy life beforehand. And so, you know, one of the challenges, and I think this is, a, this is something that may help people. At the time that I got diagnosed, I went into a dark place because all I could do is ask myself why why and how and what what did i do to deserve this what did i do to to for this to happen to me and 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 the anger and the resentment and and all of that just tore me apart and and it wasn't until i got to a place of acceptance i got to a place where i looked at it and said wait a second i'm looking for the why behind me and the why isn't behind me. I'm looking for a place to place blame. I'm looking for a fault. I'm looking for all of that. And it wasn't until I looked at it and said, what if, what if the why is actually in front of me? What if I could look at the cancer and say, how does the cancer become valuable, become meaningful? And so this is what gave birth also to the obsession I have, because here's the thing that I did. I had to fight the cancer emotionally, um, spiritually, when you're having difficult times, emotionally, spiritually, physically, medically, I had to fight it all, but I didn't fight it financially. And, and when I got diagnosed was just before the pandemic hit. And then I watched so many people struggle. And it was like this repetitive message. And I go, I didn't struggle. I didn't struggle through the pandemic financially. I didn't struggle through the cancer financially. I said, wait a second. And James is telling me I need to put this stuff out there. These are messages. And I said, what if the cancer was this, this smack across the head that said, hey, numbskull, you need to go out there and serve. You need to get this out there and do this. Um, now, all of a sudden, the why is in front of me and I actually have control of the why versus being victim to the why. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we start to find the power in the struggles in our lives. It's a very Victor Frankl approach, right? Man's search for meaning. It's not, yeah, it's yeah. not life's responsibility to bring meaning to your life. It's your responsibility to bring meaning to your own life. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. And, and it, uh, you know, I didn't realize it. I, I mean, I didn't know. I mean, I never expected. Uh, two weeks before, I was literally masterminding with some of the top entrepreneurs, you know. Uh, mm, Puerto in, Rico. In Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. We flew back on a G5. I mean, mm -hmm. I, there's no. I've seen the to, pictures. <laughs> I've heard yeah, about it. <laughs> and, it's like, and then two weeks later, all of a sudden, life's turned on its head and I'm in a hospital bed. And they're going, hey, you might lose your bladder and we might have, you know, and I'm like, oh, what? How does this, you know, so. 
So I think that the real question for me is this, how do we make those days count? Um, we all hear, you know, your days are numbered. I didn't, I didn't really pay attention to it until I really had to face mortality and the possibility of, and it wasn't about death that concerned me as much as it was not being able to continue to live my life because I love my life. I love my wife. I love my son and my friends. And I'm going, I'm not, I'm not ready to stop this. And so, you know, once I got to that point and said, let's, let's figure out a why let's get to acceptance. And then you say, okay, we got a, we got a battle on our hands. What, you know, what does this entail? What do we need to do? And, and uh, you know, I was, I was fortunate in the sense that, uh, my, my wife, my friends, um, are, were, have been by my side every step of the way. And, and it's been a, a crazy journey, but I look at cancer as a blessing right now. What is it being on this side of it, on the acceptance, on the why, on the blessing side of it, what does this teach you about fear, loss, um, scarcity, th those types of things that most people fall into? Not as far as maybe hopelessness, yeah, and apathy, yeah. but but just that just that dangerous cocktail that 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 starts to erode our confidence in the future and our abilities. And you know, life gave me this. What else will life give me? And if that's in the back of your mind, that's going to slow you down. Yeah, I, you know, I, I I think you're right. It it can, um, and it, there, I think that there's a couple things. One, we need to look at the environment we're in. I had myself in a, you know, the people we hang out with. I am in a, in an environment with, with a lot of positive people, a lot of people that are, that are behind me and rallying me. And, you know, I got to get in the ring and I got to fight the battle, but I wasn't alone. And there's something about to be said for not feeling alone. Now I started it alone. Cause I went to that dark place. I didn't want to talk to people. In fact, I got, I got, I got bitched at by Brendan for not calling often enough to check in, you know, Evan checked in with me on a regular basis. Uh, and, I, and I think that one is what's the, what's the aquarium you're swimming in. And because that has a lot to do with if, if the, the, if the water you're swimming in is dirty, if it's tainted, if it's, if it's, you know, a lot of pessimism, a lot of negativity and a lot of that, it's hard to not get poisoned by that. Well, it's hard to, to move, move past it. Now that then creates the level of fear that uh, then starts to create all kinds of, of things that aren't necessarily your, your direct act, but as a result of being swimming, swimming in a poisoned environment, it, it, it is. And so, you know, over the years, unfortunately, I've had to, I've had to let go of some friends that had, that I realized be, were going to become this anchor in my life. As much as I cared for them, they all they saw was was the negativity and the and 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 problems and that type of thing. And that energy um, was tough. So I I protect my space and I protect my mind very um, very vigilantly. You know, I, I don't, I don't. you know what I, I I'm starting to get there myself, but you have to be willing to, you know, they talk in psychology about, about all the different factors that go into personality. And one of them is disagreeableness. Yeah. Right. Like being comfortable, being disagreeable. Um, now I'm not talking about being aggressive, but yeah. you have to be comfortable being like, no, I'm not going to go do that. And they're like, well, why? everybody's coming. You're like, yeah, no, I, that's okay. I'm just, I'm a little bit tired. I think no, I'm not going to do that. And it's just like this. <laughs> it's so cool. It's so yeah. cool that you're saying this. I think it's a beautiful way to live, believe it or not. And, and some people might say, well, you're disregarding your people. Here's, here's how I look at it. And this came out of the cancer. Cause someone asked me, how has the cancer changed you? And I said, you know what? It's easier for me to say no to things. <laughs> and they go, what? And I go, think about it. I finally realized that they were right. We've all been given just a certain number of slices of life. Now, I don't know how many slices I got. I hope it's a whole bunch, okay? But here's what I do know. Every time I say yes to something, I'm giving a slice away. I can't get it back. 
I'll never get it back. And at the same time, those that are saying yes with me, they're giving a slice away too. So I know that if I'm going to say yes to something, I doggone better know that I can put all of me in that moment. Everything I got has to come to that moment. And I expect the same in return. Otherwise, the transaction makes no sense. And it's a transaction that is far more valuable than any money because I'm giving a slice of my life away to do it. And so I have no remorse to say no to things that I don't feel fully invested in. This is a sentiment I've heard from many people who have faced illness, who have faced death. Um, it's a boldness and it's, and it's, um, it comes off, it comes off to other people as like, well, that's arrogant or that's egotistical or wow, you think you're so much better. But like, but I've heard this from people who have faced this, this like, um, acceptance of, you know, like my time is valuable. My energy is finite. Uh, I'm going to apply to the things that matter most to me. Um, I think you're, you're, you're right on. And richness in life doesn't come from the possessions you have. It's about the things that you've let go of. Just my belief. Now, I got plenty of possessions, but at the same time, um, I'm not going to be attached to a lot of things. And I'm not going to, the, the, the bigger thing, especially in the social media world, especially in the, the kind of environment we're in. I watch so many people that are so concerned about the people right and left, what they see on Facebook, Instagram, that what the media is saying, you know, the person next door just, just bought a, a, a Yukon and you're going to go buy Denali just to show them up. All of a sudden you're in debt and you're making bad financial decisions, keeping up with the Joneses, doing all those things. And, and in the end, who suffers? You suffer because you actually not live in your life. My neighbor just got a new truck and I, there's nothing wrong with my truck, but my neighbor got a new truck and I was like, that's a really nice new truck. And we were walking by and it had that like smell. And I was just, like, <laughs> I turned to my wife yesterday. I was like, maybe I should get a new truck. <laughs> and I realized I caught myself. I was like, there's nothing wrong with my truck. I don't need a new one. I just want one. I look, I am not exempt. I did yesterday. I was on a, on a call and someone was talking about getting a, a, a MacBook, a new MacBook M1, the M1 chip MacBook pro. Like I just got a new MacBook, but I needed the 16 inch screen instead of, course, of, of course you need it. Of course. You know? it's gonna make so you more I got that one and I literally got on Apple and looked at the M1 and go, how much is it? And I go, what am I doing? I don't need this. <laughs> so, I mean, this might be a, a natural transition to money, right? So, so you talked about transitions or sorry, transactions. You talked about the clarity that you have on this side of it, but money is something that is, I mean, obviously it's taboo. It's something that most people are not comfortable with. We don't teach, you know, I know within myself, like I grew up in the most hardcore scarcity family in the world. So yeah. my grandparents uh, were from Germany, Ger pre-war kind of thing. So they grew up um, having they were very successful. They were very lucky, but like zero debt, never leverage debt, um, pay for everything in cash, um, pay off everything immediately. Um, hold on to as like, like even myself, I have everything sitting in cash. I've, I, I don't have any investments cause I don't trust the stock market. Mark, Mark, I, I, Mark we're going to talk. <laughs> so I have everything sitting in cash. Um, I have lots of runway, which makes me feel very comfortable yeah. as my, as my runway grows my comfort level goes up equally. Yeah. So it's like when I was a teenager, if I could just have two grand in the bank, I was like, Whew. and then, you know, I got a little older. I was like, I just need 10 grand in the bank. And then I was like, Whew. and then it's like, I just need a hundred grand in the bank. And it's like, and, and the number just keeps growing, but my comfort level never changes. Um, I'm, I, you don't leverage it. Like people are so uncomfortable with this stuff yeah. because we just inherit whatever comes to us. But I, I'm literally always terrified of like, like if I spend X, you know, if I spend X on this, what if in two years I run out and I'm going to really be mad at myself for spending this money here so frivol frivolously? I might need that in three years. Yes. Help, me. So, Help me, Mel. <laughs> well, I, this is such a great conversation that most people don't want to have. Um, but let's, let's just look at first, where do we get our financial, our money education from? It's not in school. It's certainly not in the media. Um, so we not in advertising, from, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, we we get it from observation, but we never discern, or we're not very discerning with who we're observing and what their habits are. And it could be something as little as, you know, a parent just saying money doesn't grow on trees. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I work 10 hours a day to, to put food on the table and you take that and make it mean something that turns you into a money hoarder. Okay. Uh, and I'm not saying that you, that's what you're doing, but, but just saying that those characteristics, like I had a client once, uh, I was doing business management back in the day of, you know, they both have unfortunately passed away. But I was business management with them and, and they were um, concert promoters. And the wife one time went out and said, and spent, spent $22,000 on shoes, 52 pairs of shoes, ran it up on a credit card and then said, don't tell my husband because I was the one that paid the bills. I go, how do I not tell your husband that I got a $22,000 shoe bill to pay? But the 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 animosity that cre- that that created the inability to have real communication about money created a financial issue until they they finally worked through it and and so we're we don't have these conversations and and the other side of it i don't i think that the financial services industry they and this is this is me. I, look, I don't sell investments, so so sometimes they don't like me. But <laughs> I sell people's future, right. in the sense that that the financial services industry has a bias and a benefit to making it feel like like investing and money management is complicated, and it's not. If you can add, if you can subtract, then you can manage your money. And it just takes some very basic principles to sit, sit back and do that. We no longer have to. I, my core belief is that financial independence is a birthright. We just need to go out, go out and, and claim it. And, and yet we think it's hard to make money. You know, you know all it would take is 200 bucks a week, 200 bucks, uh, uh, 200 bucks a month, 50 bucks a week. Yep. It's $10,000 over five years. Over five years. Yep. But you know, if you invest that, over 30 years, it's, it's, it's almost $400,000. I only, I only know that because I, I, I tuck away a hundred dollars every two weeks to, for, for our like family splurge, take the kids yeah. to Disney type trip. And so it's just like, <laughs> but now what we need to do. So here's the thing. We, we, we're raised in an industrial age mentality. Still, they tell you to go out there and, and sell your time for money. Mm-hmm. So, so we go out there and we sell our time for money as an employee, as an, as, as a sole proprietor or sole, solopreneur, we sell our time for money. And then there's a, there's a, a group of those folks that go the selling time for money stuff stinks because it's hard work and I have a limitation and I'm either waiting for the next raise or I'm, or I, I can't go anymore. Or I'm on the, what I call the treadmill, the, the entrepreneurial treadmill. And I can't, can't do that. So what they do is they use the money that they made to buy some of their time back. And now they get a little bit of their time back and they go, now I feel better. But that still doesn't give you the richness in life, the liberation in life until you take that money and allow it to make money for you. So it buys you more money. And so what we need to think about is that all the money we earn are little foot soldiers. They're little employees that we have hired. And what we tend to do with our employees, the money, is not tell it what to do. We're not very direct with it. We're not very conscious with it, intentional with it. And think about this for a moment. If you hired 10 employees, you brought them into a room and you say, you guys got the job. I'm not telling you what your job description is. I'm not telling you what your tasks are. I'm not going to tell you what my goals are. All just, right. Just sit there. Just sit just, there. Yeah. Just go to work. Just in case I need you in the future. Yeah. I mean, would you ever do that with employees? And, and the answer is no. And if you did, would you ever get to your, your desired goal? Probably not. Yet that's exactly what we're doing with our money is that we're never, and people say, I don't want to budget. Well, it's not budgeting. It's assigning a task to the dollar. It's allowing it to, to know what it's supposed to do for you to benefit you in the future. And when you assign the task, all of a sudden it starts to do the things that it's supposed to do. And, and so what we need to think about, and, and dollars, they're the best employees you got because guess what? They don't talk back. <laughs> they, they don't talk back. 
They work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They don't take holidays and there is no union. So I don't know. I think we, we and you so know what it is? A it's, it's a lack. It's a lack of belief in our own ability. So, yeah. so, so I don't trust, I, I don't trust people very much. So, you know, like my wife's like, Mark, you should really go talk, you know, you should go talk to your doctor or check in or something. And I was like, well, I haven't been talking to my doctor in 10 years. I don't trust my doctor. I, I don't trust money managers and I don't trust myself because I don't, I, I know I don't know. Like, I know I don't know. So I'm, I'm so what do I do? <laughs> what, what is, what do we do when, when you, when you don't trust the people because of, because of all of the mess yeah. and you, and you know, you don't have the skill set, you're kind of just stuck, aren't you? You, you, you are, but here's what I would invite you to do is the possibility of dipping your toe in the water mm -hmm. in a couple of areas. One is um, education, you know, taking a little bit of a time to say, Hey, you know, I tell my clients uh, and the people that go through some of my programs, they say, we never invest in things we don't understand. We don't need complex investments. I, we know what the stock market has done over, over long periods of time. You know, what I heard someone talk about it this way, the stock market is always going up, but it has its downturns. It's like someone walking uphill with a yo-yo. It goes up and down, but on long term, it's, it's gonna go up. Um, but the problem that we get into is that we allow our emotions to make our financial decisions and not our knowledge and logic. And when emotions go up in finances, intellect goes down. It's how I got caught in the Ponzi scheme. Mm -hmm. And they know that the psychological triggers, the emotional triggers, and they got me hooked. And I knew about, better. We're talking about fear. We're talking about greed. What, yes. what are we talking about here? You're, even aspiration to the, the, the ability to go, wait a second, 21% return. I, wow, I could, this could put me over the edge. This could be the, 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 the win that I'm looking for. And, and, and then they, they kind of encourage it. And, and, you know, how a Ponzi scheme works is they typically, they seed the money. So you get in. They give you, you get that you get some money back and they go, oh, so it's working. Yeah, let's double down, you know? And all of a sudden the snowball of, all of a sudden I was so deep into it that I, like I said, I lost over seven figures, you know, one third of everything I own. Um, and you talk about embarrassment, shame and guilt. I'm a financial dude. I was a guy, I'm a CPA. I, this should have never happened to me. I'm the kind of guy they hired to put to, to testify. In fact, I testified the grand jury here and to put this guy in jail. And, and yet I got taken. Okay, so how do you rebuild? So in that moment, walk me through the path to getting comfortable with it, accepting it and rebuilding from loss. So the first, the first thing, again, I had to get back to acceptance. I had to say, and I had to be willing to not from a, let me beat myself up blame perspective, but from a responsibility perspective to accept my role in the loss. Uh, because if I wasn't willing to accept the decisions that I made and just put it all on the guy that did it. And now, granted, most of it is him. He stole from me. He, he was a liar. He was a cheat. He was a thief. Okay. However, I put myself in that position. I continue to put myself in that position and I made those decisions until I got to that point. I'm not willing to look for the lessons in it. Now I'll give you a, why that a, an example, there was three of us, three of us in it. There was more than that, but it was the, there was me and two buddies that got into it that I knew one of them. He was retired at the time that he, that this happened. He just shrunk his life down, adjusted some things and can continue to live. Okay. He said, eh, it's going to hurt, but let's just get on with life. But the one that got us both into it, he, he was so entrenched into it that he spiraled into anger. He spiraled into resentment. He ended up destroying his business, destroying his marriage and destroying his liver. He's just coming out of it. And this was 2005. We're talking 15 years later. Um, and he's putting his life back together again. So, I mean, we have choices in how this was going to work. Now for me, I was 
going down that same path because, in fact, I was the financial guy. It should have never happened. But, you know, talk about the people you're around and your why. I was a single full-time dad of my, of, of my son, Jeremy. And I realized that in this adversity, if I curled up in the fetal position, then that was the example I was setting. And then when t- things got rough in his life, he would believe that the, West, the best way to handle it was to just curl up in the fetal position and wait for the storm to pass. And we know that the storm doesn't necessarily pass if we don't move through it ourselves. And so I think the first thing is acceptance. Uh, then when you, once you come from acceptance is then to look at it and say, what did I learn? What do I need to do differently so it doesn't happen again? So it doesn't happen to my friends or anyone else again. And, and put those things in place. And then just like they say, get up, get back on the horse after you fall, you got to get back in the game. You got to get back in the game. Otherwise what's going to happen is that it's going to set in and you're going to be, you're going to be uh, scared to do it. Uh, you know, I had an horrible, it's funny now it was horrible at the time. <laughs> um, you know, I did one of my first, uh, so I'd been doing webinars like this and stuff for a long time, but this was the first time I was doing a webinar um, where I was the tech and the talent. And this is for an organization that gave me a lifetime achievement award. A lot of cons- accountants, attorneys, act- so it was financial people. They were very conservative. It's a morning webinar. I roll out of bed. I have my Superman pajama bottoms on, no shirt. And I plug in, put my headphones in, and I start the webinar. Now it's supposed to be me and slides. You know, no picture, no as This was years ago. And and next thing I know, I see the chat. We were on uh, GoToWebinar. I see the chat and I hear, and I see people saying, Mel's naked. No. <laughs> uh, the camera was on. Oh my God. Somehow I turned the camera on. I couldn't figure out how to turn it off. I had to get a post-it note and put it on the camera. And oh. I'm like, how do I survive this? How do I live through this? How do I, you know, but what I had to do is get, well, first I had to complete that. I had to finish the webinar, uh, shirt off and everything, camera, camera covered with a post-it, but I had to go back out and do it because it would have been easier, easy for me to sit back and go, I'm never doing that again. I can't do this technology thing. It's screwed up. And, and look at me now, I'm embarrassed for life. You know, funny thing is that I'm flying up to keynote their conference um, this month, next month, you know? So, so now you got a story to walk out on stage. I, I really hey, do. I really hey, do. I'm wearing I clothes wear this time. Shirt. I'm wearing clothes this time. It's great. Yeah. But I think that, that we need to get back in the game. Hmm. You know, how, how many times do we, we have a loss and then we just are gun shy to do it, but we get back in the game only when we have new knowledge, new guidance and new skills. So we go, we get awareness, we get the lessons, we sit back and go, oh, you know what? I need to learn more about that. We get the knowledge and I go, I wonder if there's someone that can coach me in this or help me in this. And I get someone to help me through it. And now we move forward. And so you're, you're more, more equipped the next go around. Is there a certain amount of, and I know this is not prescriptive, Yep. but is there a certain amount of attack time that's that or intention that's required, you know, um, like for right now, for myself, um, I'm transitioning. Um, I'm transitioning some parts of my life, and I see new opportunities in front of me. But those new opportunities feel so much like the old ones that I don't want to fall into the same trap. And so I'm purposefully saying no to things that I could very easily say yes to, only because I want to give myself time. But I'm hearing you, and I'm saying, and and, and I realize that a new opportunity could have a new outcome, and I might be, I might be resisting the very thing that's not even the right thing. It's not even, it's not even the same situation. Right. But I want to give myself time. But is there an, is a certain certain attack time, or I, even grace that you need to give? You know, I think it, it depends. But I try to try to get back in the game within ninety days. Like if I had a failed launch, let's put another one on the calendar in, 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 within 90 days. And it forces, I, I feel like there's, there, there's this, this, this pent up pressure by putting that date on the calendar again and, and, and announcing to the world and saying, 
Look, so I took two years out, out of my business after when I got diagnosed in 2019 with a cancer so I could focus on healing. And I said, all right, I'm back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And I kept saying it, but I never came back. You know, so we were in uh, November, December of last year. And I said, you know, I'm going to launch the new program. I'm going to. And so I did a lot of talking. And I said, I'm never going to do this unless I put it on the calendar. So what did I do? I put a date on the calendar. Why, why not? Because again, you've done this before. You have experience. You have friends. You have connections. You have resources. You have everything you need. What was within you that was keeping you from driving things forward? I think, I think both fear and comfort. Okay. You know, I didn't, you know, in fact, David, David Bach and I were talking, uh, he, cause he called me up cause I, I'm working on, on a book, uh, a follow up book and I've got the new, the new uh, podcast and show. And he says, why are you doing this? You don't need to do this. And, uh, and I think that, that had, had tugged at me. Now, some people may not ha be in that position and there should be an, an urgency to, to get out of your comfort zone because the, the dreams that we want and we truly desire are on the other side of that wall. Um, and, uh, but I, I was, for me, particularly what I watched is the vitriol that went on on the internet in that last half of 2020 and everything. And I go, do I really want to get back in the game? Do I need to have that in my life? Do I want to, to engage with the trolls and the people that, that can be haters and they're, they're the haters at a keyboard with no, no foundation and, and everything. And, and the thing that, so that's where I, I was kind of reluctant to get back out and do lives and, and everything. So, uh, and get back out on video. And so I put the, a webinar on the calendar. I put a, 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 a zoom training on the calendar and then I posted it and I, and then I, had an ads person I said, start running ads to it. And as soon as I had half a dozen people registered, I'm in the game and I got to do it. <laughs> it's that, it's that forced leverage Tony Robbins uh, talks about. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, oh, I love it so much. And this is so interesting to me. Like I had James Altucher on the podcast because he's uh, obviously released his new book, skip the line. And out of, out of nowhere, he said, Oh, you know, I wrote this article in August about how much New York is kind of over and everybody hated me so much. I stopped writing. And so I was interviewing him in like March or April and I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, you're this prolific writer who just stopped writing. He's like, yeah, yeah. I just couldn't bring myself to write. <laughs> and so we don't see, I mean, this is, this is why I love being able to connect with you and James and other people. Like we don't see it, right? What we see is Wikipedia. What we see is the website. We see the bylines, we see the breakdowns. And sometimes you know, I had another person on uh, who's a, a really amazing actor and you go to IMDb and you see hit after hit after hit. But if you look at the dates, sometimes there's three or four years between those releases. And I'm always curious what's happening in those three or four years. Right. And so what we're going to see when we look back 10, 20 years from now is we're going to see this gap in your achievements, but there's like a lot yeah. in those two years. And there's a lot in that window of time where you're afraid to jump back into it because no one would think you would be like, why should you be your friends with Brendan and you hang out with these great people and everyone is supporting you and everyone, again, you have everything you need. You know, don't, don't you? I, I, look, I, I think we all do in a sense, at least there are resources available, but I'm human. Um, I feel just like everyone else does. And I get scared. Um, I care what people think. I care about people. Um, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, I, it's, it's one thing when you get out there on a, on a video, or you're doing a speech or you're speaking and, and I've spoken to two people, 10 people and thousands of people. Um, but it's another thing when, when, and I don't know why human nature is this way. It's another thing when someone tries to make you feel wrong or less than, and, and, or that you're damaged and, and, and that type of thing. And, and I'm not any less susceptible, I think, than, than anyone else to it. Um, I, I'm, 
maybe better equipped because of the people I've been around and watching how they've navigated it to be able to compartmentalize it and put it into a, an appropriate perspective. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't affect me. I don't know what it is about human nature that you go and do. I remember when I, I would speak at these conferences and, you know, there's 600 people and then they send you the evaluations and there's, you know, I don't know, out of 600 people, 400 did the evaluations and there's 10 of them that are bad and you're focused on the 10 and not the 390. And you're kind of going and you're trying to, you're trying to please the 10. And I get that. You want everyone to like you. You want everyone to, to, you want to impact everyone, but, but we're, for, we're, we're forsaking the 390 that we made a difference to that got it, that, that really made it, made, made something happen for them, that something moved for them. And, and the other, the other thing with the, the, the other 10 was like, it may not have been me. I just may have been the, the person they put it on. It may have been things that they're going on, going through themselves. They're not ready to hear the message. They don't like the message because they got to face themselves in the mirror and they got to see it. So, so we take it on as if we did something wrong and, and everything. And, and I see it so much with some of the people that I work with where they're saying, ah, I'm, I'm afraid to do it. But here's the thing. Uh, what I want people to understand is first, I want them to believe. Um, believe in the possibility that exists because it is out there. We, and, and I want them to believe that, that, it is possible to be financially independent. It is possible to, to not have to live a life that is defined by others, but defined by yourself. Um, there's a lot of examples out there. And if one person can do it, other people can do it. You know, people will say, I hear people say, well, you know, you got to inherit wealth. Do you know that, that over 80% of millionaires are first generation millionaires, meaning that they didn't inherit it. They didn't win it. They made it. They created it. Um, and, and there was a study done by, uh, Harvard, 4,000 millionaires. It was a happiness study. And one of the things that they studied was what makes these millionaires happy. And you know what? It wasn't the money they made. One of the biggest factors that made them happy was how they made the money mm. instead of the money they made. And I think that we need to look at that and start to, to birth that. And so for me, the book and everything that we're doing is, is about bringing that to, to entrepreneurs especially, but individuals to be able to, to say, here's the tools, here's the tactics, here's the strategies to scale your business, scale your money, scale your life, live it fully by your own de definition, not what some financial advisor or the media, or your social media, your parents, your brothers or sisters, it doesn't matter. It's your life. I don't want you to get on the last days of your, your existence and go, damn man, I, I lived someone else's life. I didn't live mine. Can you have both? Because, because we know that you can make money and, and feel trapped. Yep. We know that you can feel free by burning everything to the ground and throwing caution to the wind. And it's very freeing and amazing for a short term. It seems very rare or it seems sometimes unobtainable for most to have both. The freedom that comes with the lack of responsibility, um, the lack of working for other people, the lack, like, like, I don't want to call it even retired life because that even itself is a cage. Right. But, but how do you get the freedom of, of freedom with the ability to still not worry about income? So this is, this is such a cool, cool conversation. This is why I use the term affluence and not wealth. Wealth is a statistic. It's, um, it's the dollars in the bank. And we all know and probably have seen a lot of people that are wealthy and friggin' miserable. <laughs> they're, they're train wrecks. You look at their lives, their relationships, their health, everything, they're horrible. To me, that's, that, that is not richness. And I think that's what we're looking for is truly richness. The second thing I think is, is important to understand is, is that when we look at building freedom, financial freedom is, is at the base. It's actually, it's actually the lowest level freedom that we're looking for. But when we talk about freedom, most people will talk about financial freedom because they don't have it. 
But there's studies that show once you make a certain amount, the level of happiness doesn't go incrementally with, with that. I mean, you, you, just like you said, your level of comfort didn't move up as, you, as more money was in the bank. You, you know, so, so what else is there? Well, what else is there is time freedom. Mm. And I think that it doesn't matter whether you have a dollar in the bank or a hundred million dollars in the bank. If you don't control your time, you're poor. You're living in poverty because it's the one aspect of your life that is truly, truly fine out. We can all go make some more money. We can sell stuff. We can do whatever, but we can't go buy more time. And so if I don't control my time and someone else does, I don't care what the money is. I'm living a poor life. And the third element of this is that you have mind freedom that you can live in peace, that you get a chance to, to know that things are okay. And so one of the things that I look at is that too often we equate freedom to money, whereas freedom is more of a feeling. Freedom is more of an act. I have friends that would love to be in a tent in Montana. I have no, uh, no desire to go rough it, okay? Um, I'm, I'm, you know, get me get me to the, get me to, to, to the, the Ritz or yeah. something, you know? Um, and so, uh, so, but that's their definition. And to them, that's freedom. But too often, we actually don't even take the time to define it for ourselves. We allow it to be defined upon us. Now, there is a base level. We got to earn money. We got to make money to pay the bills. Once we know that our, 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 our necessities are covered, then we can look at it and say, okay, necessities are covered. How do I pay into my future? So I don't always have to to be controlled. I can, I can start buying my time back, like I said. And so, so at some point, necessities are covered. I then take the excess cash to buy my time back by making sure that I fund my future. And then once I do that, I go, all right, I, I've got some time back. I'm doing the things that bring me joy and fulfillment and richness in my life. Now let's take the, the, those dollars and get them to work to make more dollars. Let's get them to reproduce which allows me to do the things even more and to give you more choice. The reason you need the, the reason we need the money is for choice, not for necessity. We want it for choice. I love it so much. It's so good. Okay. Um, final question. Yeah. For you at the end of the day, what does this all come down to? Uh, I think for me, the, the, the word that I um, use, I remember when I met my wife, and we'll, be, we'll hit 10 years, our 10 year anniversary next month. But I, I used to use the word, and I still do, uh, legacy a lot. And she thought, now she came from Philly, so I, I understand her thinking. She thought I wanted the Rocky statue on the, on the steps somewhere, okay? I go, no, 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 no. See, because for me, legacy is not something we leave behind. Legacy is not something that we wait to die and then we go, oh, there's the legacy. Legacy is something that we create in the moment. You and I, Mark, right now with the listeners, with the viewers, we're creating legacy because their lives can shift. And so for me, I just want to know that the moment mattered. And if I can put a bunch and string a bunch of the moments together that matter, then I know I did something good here and 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 do it that way and so my my legacy is built moment by moment and not something that i want people to look back when i'm gone and say you know he did good i'd rather know while i'm living that i'm doing all right i'm making a difference and and so and i think that when we look at those moments whether it's with your your significant other when whether it's you know with your children and you think about it and say, this is my opportunity to create legacy. This is my opportunity to make a moment matter. You'll be more present. You'll be more there and it actually will matter. Oh, I love connecting with Mel. He was so raw and so revealing. No matter what question I threw at him, he answered. I loved it. Okay, three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, often life's greatest gifts come disguised as a disaster. It's hard in the moment, but if you can avoid the freak out when you're facing that disaster, and if you can choose 
to see these moments as gifts, you'll be better off. Number two, true wealth comes from having freedom over your time to do what you want, when you want. We can always make more money, but we cannot buy more time. And number three, continuing with the theme of time, we've all been given a certain number of days and your time and your energy are valuable. Have zero Fs given over saying no to the things that you're not fully invested in. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to the little voice that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that's you, you've got to face the difficult, the scary, and the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But remember, we, we're not just dreamers, we're doers, because we do hard things. If you've not heard the conversation that I had with the motivational legend, Les Brown, where we get into some of the toughest moments in his life, you have got to hear this story. Click on the link right over there and I will see you there.